what if you come up with a vaccine for covid in the next 3 months that's not the answer in itself unless that vaccine can be distributed and distributed at a reasonable price mm. and this is where the gamesmanship will begin people will try and begin to monopolize that intellectual property to mark up prices that's where compulsory licensing in in patent law will come in so i see a, a great deal of scope i think for public health uh, medicine and the law coming together in the coming years so it's certainly something you should uh, consider special guest uh, who's agreed to come on live with us today i'm super excited um hi hello sir uh, uh, can you hear me clearly yes i can asan thank you awesome um so, so guys today we have dr aditya sondhi um senior advocate uh, on with us i'm going to go ahead uh, today's session is going to be uh, we're, we're titling it the law the lockdown and a new world order um i'm going to begin by giving a brief introduction about dr sondhi and then we'll get into a quick uh, q and a and, and and then we'll just see how it flows okay um so dr sondhi is a senior advocate uh, who's been practicing before the high court of karnataka and the supreme court of india uh, he has served as additional advocate general for karnataka for 2 years um he is a visiting faculty member at the national law school of india um where he graduated in 1998 he holds a phd from mysore university uh for his research on the interface between the army and democracy uh india and pakistan compared uh additionally uh dr sondhi has also been a tedx speaker and lectured across the country um and abroad uh his online talks are widely viewed he's a great public speaker um he has uh, published he's been published twice with Pe- penguin books in india I have one of his books in my house. Um it's called The Order of the Crest. A uh, great read. I'm a I'm a fellow Cretonian. I was in Pettigrew House. What house were you in, sir? I was back in Walsh as in. Ah, okay. <laughs> But um, we'll let that go for now. We we'll let it go for now. We'll come back to it. Um um yes, uh, oh, also also um uh, Dr. Sondhi likes to dabble in amateur theater. Uh his his interests include wildlife and rugby. So I'm I'm so excited to talk to you with with all these different interests and all the all this ex- rich experience that you bring to us. I uh, thank you for for giving us this time and allowing us to engage with you. You're very welcome, Azan. Um so uh Dr. Sondhi, uh let me start off with um us getting to know you as a person. Um how are you spending your time at home during during the lockdown? um are the empty streets as you go on a walk are they making you feel nostalgic and the clean air is it reminding you of your days in bishop cottons well i'm not as old as you think but uh, yeah it's it's nice to be on the streets though today the cops i think rightly asked all walkers to go back home so i think our evening walks are also now going to be confined to our apartment spaces okay but as to how i'm spending my time will you mention my thesis uh, that got me my phd which i had submitted to the mysore university 8 years ago okay and it's been in the pipeline that i publish it so i finally gotten down to converting it into a book mm-hmm. and that's really what's been keeping me occupied for the last uh, well 3 weeks now okay um doing doing a bit of writing and a fair bit of editing and research mm-hmm. and that fills up a good part of my day uh, that that part of course i think i'm doing pretty much what everyone else is netflix and some music and uh, some downtime basically it, yeah. it's interesting because this lockdown has given a, a lot of us the chance to do the things which we always said I'll come to it one day um and and it's kind of there's no excuses now we're at home the day has come right <laughs> <I think so. laughs> um so so um i wanted to i wanted to get your thoughts on a lo- as a lot of our audience I, I'll, i'll actually preface this um by saying that much like myself a lot of our audience is entrepreneurs and creative minds who may have limited sure. knowledge of the law um right uh, as entrepreneurs we tend to uh, think of uh, uh, the legal system only when we have an issue or a problem maybe we need to uh, get in or get out of a contract or something in between with a dispute um sure what, i would love to hear from you as someone from, who represents the legal system 
what what is um what is a better relationship that entrepreneurs can maybe uh have with the legal system so it's more proactive instead of reactive well that's a good question and i think i need to answer that at many levels mm-hmm. because uh, entrepreneurs are citizens to begin with they are also folks who rely on the legal system and i think going forward entrepreneurs are going to be participants in justice delivery because <clears throat> your title as we came up together is a new world order and when i speak of a new world order i'm i'm limited by my knowledge of the law mm-hmm. and i can see that the legal regime is going to undergo a massive structural change uh, as we speak mm-hmm. i mean for the longest time e hearings e filings and so on were things that were only talked about mm-hmm. some courts were doing it many courts were not and today mm-hmm. during the lockdown the courts are functioning only through through e hearings mm-hmm. and therefore i think entrepreneurs are going to be participants in the technology in the ideation in the structures on which a healthy legal system in india will develop very very rapidly because we're never really going to go back to the old normal as i can as i can see it so therefore entrepreneurs a i think have a have a scope in uh, the way the legal system is going to play out over and above that in a more direct sense i think entrepreneurs many times don't uh, think about the legal outcomes of their transactions their their investments their contracts and i think it's uh, fair to say that anyone in a startup or in a new business especially in a weaker negotiating position ought to have a good and a reliable in house counsel or uh, an external law firm to seek counsel from because you mention contracts now contracts are often drafted at a time when people are not really looking at the nitty gritty of the deal you're looking more at uh, the transaction as opposed to the letter of the law mm-hmm. and it's only a, lo- a lawyer that's probably going to be able to preempt situations preempt disputes uh, safeguard interests so that engagement i think is also important for entrepreneurs Uh, to be prudent about the manner in which they transact mm-hmm. that's super interesting so do you think um that uh with you spoke about e governance um could you tell us some of the the ways that the government is going online both in terms of um them communicating internally <clears throat> as well as interacting with citizens and creating portals where we can uh, you know log in and 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 do all kind access all kinds of schemes and benefits sure look my knowledge of governmental uh, practices is as good as anyone else's because i'm no longer the additional advocate general and of course i can see that there's a great deal of uh, outreach happening through uh, online uh, platforms at different levels right from a direct communication that a that a prime minister or a chief minister can make through his or her twitter handle down to the availment of benefit schemes and so on but i can say that there are white papers being prepared on the way the legal system will need to engage with technology it's all very well to say that we go into e hearings and and so on but there are multiple issues there there are issues related to privacy when we talk about a new world order we talk about new data protection law you're going to go into a greater deal of artificial intelligence you're going to go into a greater deal of possibly even surveillance who knows right if your health is to be monitored if apps are to be downloaded to uh, follow you if you are under quarantine that willy nilly is a form of uh, surveillance if you will and that's the new the new era we're going to live in so in yeah. the legal system itself i think there are going to be <clears throat> there's going to be a great deal of scope for entrepreneurs who can work with lawyers and almost become quasi lawyers on on their own Okay. you try and see how a the system can become more efficient yeah uh, there are frequent grievances that the system is slow that hearings take long yeah. uh, for example even the availability of online research material libraries will probably have to migrate yeah. online legal education will be yeah. online as i can see it uh, legal clat admission exams so i think within that spectrum there's going to be a great need for multidisciplinary inputs Uh, lawyers technocrats technologists 
uh, entrepreneurs, people who get the drift of what the system is, make it more efficient, make it safer. <clears throat> In our urge to go sort of online, we can't also run the risk of privacy violation. You can't run the risk of documents being tampered, for example, how yeah. you submit documents online. So I think these are going to be the areas where entrepreneurs can step in and make a, a marked difference if they work with, with the courts. I, I completely agree. I think that um, similar to what, what happened with demonetization, where after that you saw a huge surge in digital currency, um, I think sure. when multiple surges that will happen after this lockdown and one of them will be law tech because people will realize you the government has to go on things have to go on and the best way to do it is to work with entrepreneurs come up with these solutions and you know make make this tech in i agree eman eman who's a community manager with us sir has a question um she says that, um she says the gov government says that Zoom isn't safe as a platform for video conferencing. But in this pandem pandemic situation, Zoom has actually seen a boom in usage. What's your take on this in terms of privacy of such apps? Yeah, it's a good question. I think everyone's grappling with it. There's a functionality to apps such as Zoom because they're suddenly bringing uh, people well face to face in, a, in, a, in an uh, electronic sense. But naturally, there are going to be concerns with, with privacy, especially when it comes to using these platforms uh, for official purposes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, these were issues back in the day when Hotmail was the initial email available. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of government transactions took place using Hotmail IDs. In fact, mm -hmm. even now I'm surprised to see that free email IDs are being used for government purposes. And we know that that can lead to leaks, it can lead to tampering, it can lead to hacking yeah, and yeah. so on. So I, I have no personal opinion on Zoom because I don't know how safe it is or it's not. Um, I would assume <clears throat> that the government is saying this responsibly, that it's got uh, a responsible sort of opinion from people who know the, the turf to say that you've got to be uh, careful with it. Um, uh, I, I can see that Zoom's come into the limelight all of a sudden in the last month or so. I mean, people have been using it for years, but the, the demand has surged completely over the last month or so. So whether it's driven by competitors, is it driven by half information? I don't know, but I certainly do think, and this brings me back to the point I made, that if you're going to migrate to technology platforms for official government purposes, or for that matter, for business purposes, your security systems have to be completely foolproof. And uh, that audit is also going to be very much a part of the way forward. Okay. Um, I have a question, a bit of a selfish question because I need advice. Um, I, I run a co-living and a co-working and an event space called The Hub. Um, so sure. we run, it's basically an offline community where everybody comes together and interacts. So the lockdown sure. hit us pretty hard. For the, I, I don't think for the next three to six months, things are going to really pick up steam. Um, sure. It's not a quick bounce back like maybe some sectors might have. What? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this brings into uh, this brings up a lot of questions about our contracts with our, our co-working clients, our co-living clients, events having to be postponed. What's your advice sure. for a lot of these businesses uh, that are facing a similar, that's in a similar position to us? Uh, what's right. what, this general advice, how to navigate this, what's an approach you would recommend? Look, this is an issue that's going to come up across businesses. Um, there are, for example, folks who have large spaces on rent in malls, let's say. Are they required to continue to pay their rents to their landlords uh, during the lockdown? Uh, what is the legal position on that? Now, typically, every contract will have a force majeure clause that says that if there is an act of God or an act of government which is beyond the control of the parties, then that can excuse performance. Mm. But look, none of these clauses are hard and fast and they're always subject to interpretation. In fact, up until about a couple of months ago, I was doing a, a very interesting arbitration which related to the termination of a contract because of demonetization. And now the question was whether demonetization is a force majeure that, that validates the termination of a contract and as much as the lockdown or demonetization may seem like it is a an act of god it's not necessary that the law will see it in that sense because it depends on the capacity of the parties to perform their contracts so i would my general suggestion would be we don't want to go into a state of litigation post covid you don't want business relationships to break 
you don't want to burden an already burdened legal system with exponential disputes simply because covid has hit businesses hard so my my general advice to people is if this is a matter of coping with two months three months let's say even six months try and sit across the table possibly renegotiate terms try and get a reasonable moratorium i know people are talking about you know splitting it down the middle if a rent is to be paid let's share it half ways because as much as you have a, a need as someone who runs a co-working space your business partner may have his or her needs in in the circumstances as well right so yeah. people are saying we don't want to pay employees because our revenue is frozen but what about the employees need so there's always going to be a balancing that takes place so my suggestion is is really uh, as far as possible people who are in the business space you want to go back to a very uncertain economic future and you don't want to be well messing up existing business existing relationships uh, and so on so as far as possible if people can be reasonable and sit across the table uh, renegotiate terms be fair i think that should be a problem solving approach if not well it's going to lead to litigation it's going to lead to a uh, multiple interpretation i don't think anyone should be under the impression that just because lockdown has happened your legal obligations have come to an end that's not the case at all it will have to be looked at on a case to case basis on a contract to contract basis and it's best that 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 route is avoided uh, that's an excellent answer i think uh, this this crisis is going to test our humanity and it's going to test the the meaning of of community when you say co-working and co-living what kind of relationship exactly. can you leverage that relationship to find a win-win solution for everyone exactly um so i'd like to ask you a question since we're talking about relationship between entrepreneurs and contracts how do you think this crisis will change the relationship between countries um i was reading a lot about how india is is giving um uh, this this the the medicine To, to countries like new zealand and then america's asking what are your thoughts on the, on on global relations look it's going to play out uh, in many ways am i loud enough uh, azan am i clear enough guys can can you hear both of us can we get a thumbs up if if we're clear sorry i should have asked you all before yeah, but i yeah. think someone would have mentioned it if we were not audible by now sure sure okay so it's a it's a good question azan i mean it's going to play out in in different ways for starters it's going to tell countries who their real friends are so your alliances are going to be reworked okay besides that there's going to be sort of geopolitical adventurism um it's not my area of expertise but i can quite tell that uh new axes are going to form people are going to try and take advantage of the situation i was just reading an article which said that if the economy is going to take such a serious hit then obviously defense spending is going to be reduced significantly now that obviously then means that uh, there could be neighbors around you who look at you and say this is a time when you are vulnerable i'm not saying that about india i'm saying that uh, generally speaking so it's really going to depend i think on on um, the bona fides of the countries involved um, there's already talk about um, you know why did the the funding to the who for example uh get paused by the us i mean there are two views on it uh there are people up in arms about it but there are equally people who say that the who has been too close uh, to the chinese establishment hasn't been forthcoming in its advice so it's going to draw out a whole set of new lines i hope this doesn't lead to you know a breach of peace i hope this doesn't lead to well people are saying this is the the third world war and so on and it's too early to say but i would hope that this experience really leads to uh, new alliances uh, the global trade situation has to be addressed internationally it's not just our problem or america's problem or europe's problem it's everybody's problem right uh, so that's going to lead to a new balance of power a lot of people are talking about manufacturing being shifted uh, uh, inwards to countries who can now develop artificial intelligence so i'm quite sure it's going to lead to a whole new set of relationships between countries but uh, will it all be for the better uh, it's it's very hard to say i have a lot of questions so i can keep going but anyone in the audience this is your chance uh, if you have a question use the question sticker like nala has done right now um and i will ask your question for you so we have nala who heads design at the hub she's asking why did you choose law when you were younger what got you attracted to this field 
Okay, sure. I mean, I've I've always said that. Um, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I've I've always said that. Um, you know, the law was an was an accident for me. I never really planned to be a lawyer coming out of school. Those were early days when the National Law School had been set up in Bangalore, and at that point, that was the only NLU around. So, in a funny way, I think the law chose me because. Uh, I was looking at a stopgap arrangement till I could go abroad, and I heard about the the law school that had come up in Nagar Bhavi, and I said, "Why not just write the entrance exam?" And I was lucky enough to to get in, and as a result of that, I sort of stuck it out, and uh, down the line, one had no choice but to 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 make it count, and that's when I really began to take the law seriously, which is pretty much towards my fourth or fifth year. But upfront, I wasn't as driven as a lot of kids are these days who already know what the rest of their lives are going to look like. Uh, law was purely an accident. That's that's interesting. That's an interesting way to get into law. Um, what what is your advice to young people um, who are looking at law as a profession? Um, what are the pros and cons of it? Um, and especially today, how is it different? Um, is it is it an exciting field to pursue? Well, I can speak for uh, advocacy and courtroom lawyering because that's really what I do. I can't speak for the other many sides of the law, but when it comes to uh, the practice of the law, of course, it's hugely exciting. It's there's never a dull moment. Every day is a new day. Every case is a challenge. Uh, there's great scope for intellectual growth. It's very stimulating, and uh, if you do reasonably well, the money is good. The status. Uh, follows if you're uh, an ethical counsel, it really expands your mind and you're a problem solver. I think if you take uh, uh, pleasure in solving problems, in bringing people relief in times of strife, then there can be no more satisfying profession than this. In fact, right now we're also frustrated because we're not able to be in court on a regular basis, and the people at the front line are the justice delivery agents, right? Your, your officers, your cops on the road. I mean, I know there are a lot of aberrations as well, but your health workers, your bureaucrats who are doing the job are the ones who are bringing relief to people on a day-to-day -day basis. So imagine if you could do that with the force of the constitution and the force of the law. It's tremendous. Uh, the downside, yeah, if I can quickly say, is it's a very tough profession. Uh, there are no shortcuts. Uh, you have to make it on your own. Nobody can molly coddle you through it um, making money as an independent lawyer takes its own time getting cases if you're a first generation lawyer takes its own sweet time but i mean these are things that people have done before and that's what toughens you up i think as a counsel so uh, i would say the the the, the pluses are are uh, bigger or greater than than the minuses and uh, the practice of the law now i believe is going to be extremely interesting because as i said Nobody really knows what sort of legal system we're going to go in when we do. It's not going to be the same. And today, if you've got, uh, you know, uh, an ease with technology, you ideate, you're yeah. willing to adapt to a new system, it's a great time to be a lawyer. That's what I wanted to uh, follow up with, um, because uh, usually when someone aspires to a certain field, they look at a lot of the innovation happening there. Um, like sure. uh, new technology, new software, new new kind of uh, machines in, in different industries. So in terms of the law, since you said AI is going to play a bigger role, I have seen uh, a, a lot of startups kind of you deploying AI to kind of um, uh, build bots that can answer your legal questions and stuff like that. How do you sure. think? How do you think studying for and preparing to enter the legal system is going to change based on these new technologies that are emerging? Is it going to be you, you, the studying process is going to be the same or are there these tools already being incorporated in early on? No, they're obviously being talked about and there are courses being offered. I know, I don't know how uh, um, widespread they are, but I have no doubt in my mind that in the curriculum that will be set in the days to come, the interface between the law and AI is going to be central to a lot of things. Look, I'll be frank with you that a, a bot cannot replace a judge or a bot cannot replace a lawyer. I certainly hope that doesn't happen in my lifetime because the beauty of the law is that yeah. it is a human profession. It's a profession based on discretion, on equity, on, on, a, on an exchange between parties. But there is room for AI to step in. Uh, 
Uh, I'm told that in China, small uh, disputes like traffic disputes and minor contractual disputes are actually being decided by by bots. Now, that's a slightly frightening thought for me. Do you want to be in a system where uh, criminal law is being administered by a bot? Certainly not, right? But short of that, uh, in terms of contracts, in terms of templates, in terms of management of uh, the the uh, the resources, uh, the libraries and so on of law firms, uh, I can see AI stepping in. So it's going to probably, I hopefully, make the, the profession easier. And for that, uh, people need to also study the legal regime over it, right? We're talking about AI today, but what AI legislation or law do you have? You don't. So even from that perspective, the study of the law and AI will be extremely important that you can then work towards developing an AI legislation that is, again, foolproof, it's ethical, it's, it, it progresses uh, mankind and doesn't sort of take us back or, or uh, subordinate us. So from that perspective as well, the law and AI interface is going to be quite important. I think that's super interesting. Just having an AI as a chatbot, which is a resource a lawyer could reach out to for questions, all the way to having... Um, and, uh, the AI making the decision, which is kind of like the scary scenario Elon Musk paints with singularity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see definitely how, how this how 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 things proceed. So I have another uh, human centered centered question for you. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, your job isn't easy, and there's a lot of stress that comes with it. Um, how do you cope with that stress? Because so, that's something that every entrepreneur, every creative person uh, goes through in one way or another. What are your coping? Of course. Look, I was recently reading the autobiography of a neurosurgeon in the UK called uh, Henry Marsh. Mm -hmm. And with him, literally, literally every surgery that he performs is a matter of life and death. And even one small move can mean the difference between someone being rehabilitated and someone becoming a vegetable or dying. Now, he says, and I, I kind of can, can relate to that. He says that if I take my work home and I attach myself to the problems of my patients or the work I do, I will break down myself. And I think for a lawyer, that's important advice that you give your cases everything you feel for your clients you do all it takes professionally to try and get a client justice. But thereafter, as far as you can, leave those problems behind. Don't bring them home. Don't internalize them. Now, this is easier said than done. I mean, I know how much trauma I've gone through when people's uh, rights and lives have been on the line. Somebody is going to be dismissed from service. Somebody is going to be convicted. Somebody's house is going to be demolished. Somebody's bank guarantee is going to be invoked. Those are stresses that you sort of have no choice but to, to share, right? But at the same time, if you want to go into a new case the next day and still be professional about it, and you owe it to everyone, right? Yeah. Like the doctor owes it to every patient. Uh, the, a lawyer owes it to every client. So I have to leave the, the stress of case X behind if I have to go into case Y fresh. So I think that is an important thing to do. And a good way to do that is, I think, to, to pursue your... Um, um, constructive distractions. I mean, I read music, uh, theater, whatever, sport, whatever sort of floats your boat. That's, Make it a very integral part of your life. That's that's my advice. Definitely. But um, just as a follow on to that, on uh, one, uh, I'm sure like a part of being a great surgeon or a great lawyer is to empathize and connect with the patient and to understand their problem. So, but at the same sure. time, the other half is to, is to keep it objective yeah. so that how do you balance those two things? So that's the balance that comes with experience. And that's the reason why uh, I said the profession is hard, that you can't just step out of law school and start doing cases because you're not wired uh, emotionally. You said it's a human question. You're not emotionally wired enough to deal yeah. with these things, right? Yeah. And that balance comes. I mean, I suppose beyond the point, you hit that sweet spot where you can say, okay, I know exactly what the problem here is. And I know what I need to do based on my expertise to try and get you that relief. That is my empathy. If I'm able to see that problem, locate it and locate the best solution for it, there are no guarantees in court, right? That's the other stress. It's not that you're going to go out there and win every case. Or you may win a case 50% and not 100%. 
clients may want uh, absolute relief but you've got to know that you've identified the problem you've worked hard at it and you've given it your best shot in court beyond that there are too many variables beyond you you have an you have an opponent sometimes you have many opponents yeah. you have judges who decide all of those factors are not within your control and therefore the empathy yes is to the point that you fully understand the problem of a client you don't uh, gloss over it or look down upon it but beyond that your your response to it has to be professional it cannot be uh, a personal response of course one on one you can always have a personal human interaction with your clients but that empathy doesn't mean that you make it your personal problem uh, that you fret over it because frankly then your ability to even analyze the case gets affected adversely mm-hmm. you're not thinking straight basically yeah. so that's that that's that thin line that you need to walk and that that i think comes from experience i think experience is key there yeah that's definitely something that you learn on pick up over the years i'm super excited my granddad is joining us from oh, down really? he's asking a question dad i'm so happy to see you on instagram live he's saying uh, what is the i'm i'm just trying to say this right what is the difference between court by delivers by rule of law or by judgment based on justice did you understand did you get the question sir uh what is the difference between when when a court delivers by rule of law versus judgment based on justice okay i understand where your your granddad is coming from and i'm i'm really glad that he is on this this chat i think what uh uh mr seth is asking is there are cases that are decided strictly as per the law where results follow and there are cases where the justice of that matter may require something beyond the law meaning to say um take the ayodhya case for example uh one way of looking at it is that it is a title suit you need to simply decide who the owner is and be done with it that's rule of law the other way of looking at it is what is the justice of the matter even if there is a losing side do you still go that extra step and try and provide some relief to a person who is even on the receiving end of the judgment i'm only using this as the example uh, whether the ayodhya judgment could have been better or not is a matter of of massive debate we'll just park that for a moment but this is the example i'm giving you which is to say simply convict somebody or do you also rehabilitate uh, the victim do okay. you simply throw somebody out of their house or do you also provide for some sort of redressal for someone who's being uh, evicted and that's always going to be the the crisis of the law because look uh, judges are not policy makers um, which is why i was advising you in my earlier answer as and then don't uh, try and break relationships don't try and take matters down that line in court because of covid right because the courts are going to be compelled to decide by the rule of law you may be hard done by as a tenant you may be hard done by as a service provider but if your contract says x the courts have to go by that which is where justice sometimes can be achieved beyond the courts i don't mean to undermine the courts in any way when i say beyond the courts i mean rather than uh, litigating and being adversarial and saying x is right and y is wrong there is great scope for parties also to arrive at a reasonable justice at as at some fairness within themselves and that really is the justice that i think that that your granddad was was talking about that, that's awesome thank you so much for answering that we have a few fans in the house we have your sister hi ravina oh god that's joining us as well um is riya here riya's here she just said hi hi <laughs> oh lovely lovely now i'm nervous <laughs> so am i so <laughs> we have a couple more questions from the audience um Riddhi who's a good friend of mine asks uh, what is your favorite book it could be law or non law related oh it it won't be law related i can <laughs> i can assure you that uh-huh. i mean i've got a a whole bunch of uh, favorite books but i mean look top of my head uh, one straw revolution by fukuoka is is a book that i i really like because it's uh, it's that classic minimalist japanese philosophy you know about uh being organic being dependent on the earth living tight living small the sort of things that we're looking at now right yeah uh, a lot of our luxury lifestyles uh, seem to be redundant yeah uh suddenly having wifi and having uh 
uh, your meals delivered to you suddenly are are a big deal yeah uh, and therefore yeah that's that's one book that's uh, close to my heart well, could you, are, i mean uh, could you rename the book a uh, one straw revolution one straw revolution got it okay yeah by fukuoka yeah okay. i got that wrote it down um uh bellu asked just here to listen will you be writing any new books yeah we were just talking about that ria uh so do you want to tell her yeah so ria like i said earlier i'm trying to convert my thesis into a into a book the theme is uh the role of the armies uh in the growth of democracy in india and pakistan and as you know both the countries have had a very different diametrically different trajectory so yeah that's hopefully going to be a, a book in the pipeline awesome uh, let's jump back to some audience questions rajat is asking um what's the method court courts or firms would need to adopt to cover the lag caused by the break uh being sensitive about the situation nonetheless look each practice is going to have its own needs right um now for someone like me who's a a practicing counsel i have a solo practice um it's going to simply mean going back to court and getting on with business as usual but i do know that there there are a lot of corporate firms that are very heavily invested um uh, in their firms in terms of their infrastructure their overheads and their decisions are uh, practically business driven because the the scale of uh, employees that they have their outgo in terms of rents there's a direct correlation ship between their revenue streams and the way their practices move and for them they're going to have to go back to the drawing board i think um they're going to have to cut flab however difficult that is uh they're going to uh, they're also going to have to be sympathetic to to their to their uh staff to their employees um there are going to be those aspects but more directly let me say this i think we are we're going to have to reinvent reinvent the wheel in a sense because mm. nobody can tell what sort of uh, litigation is going to be thrown up post covid of course all the cases that are on the back burner are slowly going to come back for hearing and that's going to be business as usual but i have no doubt that post covid there's going to be a series of litigations that are foreseen and unforeseen which will come up and that's going to mean us adapting to those challenges to just give you a quick question uh, a quick example today we've all accepted the lockdown because it seems to be broadly in our interests and it's the global precedent but equally a lawyer could technically ask the question is this constitutional mm. right uh, we're not in emergency but despite that practically all our rights are are suspended i'm not making a grievance about it i'm 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 accepting it as we should as responsible citizens yeah. but once courts reopen there's a good chance that there may be challenges in court where people may start asking these questions yeah. saying was the disaster management act the right act for you to go under yeah. uh, did it empower you to come up with such stringent measures what about those who took the you know the downside of it migrant labor yeah. daily wages and so on so first by this yeah precisely so there's going to be a lot of that that we need to adapt to us and there's no president so there definitely will be people i'm sure that i i can i can see this coming as well we have another question from pratibha she joins almost all of our live sessions hi pratibha thanks for joining us she says hello sir what is your approach or philosophy to winning or representing a case interesting question yeah it's a good question i mean i get asked this a lot um the real satisfaction in a case in my opinion is the amount you put into a case the amount you you uh, intellectually commit to a case the amount you analyze precedent and facts and prepare and cases where you get the flow in court <clears throat> you know dravid used to say that he he get into the zone sometimes when he was batting like there's a time when you you get into this bubble and you're just flowing right that is the highest satisfaction that a lawyer can have in court when you're doing a case where you have a flow your thoughts are perfectly in place where the court is listening to you and you've got scope to express yourself to me that is the aspiration i always try and reach that uh, state 
which is never easy. Winning or losing beyond that, honestly, is a variable. Look, uh, cases are only as good as their facts. Cases are won or lost depending uh, upon upon the issues that arise, upon the the judges involved, and there's only that much you can do to control the outcomes. So yeah, winning, <coughs> winning partly, losing, losing partly, they do matter to you, but they don't uh, matter as much as getting into this zone that I'm I'm trying to. Uh, okay. Explain. Okay. Yeah. We have a lot of questions. Uh, people are, are dying to ask you questions. I'm going to try and do as many as I can. Um, sure, sure. Take your time. We have about 10 minutes left, guys. I'm going to try my best. So, uh, Nesra has a really good question. Hello, sir. What is your perspective about medical law and also how it works in our society? Yeah, good question. I mean, there's a lot of uh, litigation that goes on around medical negligence, for example. Um, cases where the expertise of a, a doctor has led to the death uh, or paralysis of a patient. Okay. And those are very interesting cases to do because they're multidisciplinary. Uh, I'm doing a case which involves a hip replacement. And one of the allegations was that, you know, the replacement was defective and caused certain internal damage to a patient. Now, these are interesting cases because you can't just be a lawyer doing them. You've also become, you've also got to become a doctor to the extent you can to try and understand and explain to a court the interface between these disciplines. But more importantly, again, I think COVID related is that medical law is going to look at new issues, uh, issues that have existed, but in a new light. For example, the intellectual property regime over medicines themselves. What if you come up with a vaccine for COVID in the next three months. That's not the answer itself unless that vaccine can be distributed and distributed at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. And this is where the gamesmanship will begin. People will try and begin to monopolize that intellectual property to mark up prices. That's where compulsory licensing in, in patent law will come in. So I see a, a great deal of scope, I think, for public health, uh, medicine and the law coming together in the coming years. So it's certainly something you should uh, consider. Interesting area to watch out for, for sure. Um, we have another question here from Rajat Singh. Um, he says, mediation is the order of the day, even in high profile cases. I think he's referring to our earlier conversation. Yeah, mediation uh, is, I wouldn't say it's the order of the day. Um, the quantum of cases that go into formal mediation. Now, when you talk about mediation, Azan, we're not just talking about pre-dispute uh, negotiation. We're also talking about the resolution of disputes that are already pending in court, right? And mediation then means that the two parties with their lawyers go to a trained mediator who tries and brings the parties to a, a negotiated settlement the process is private, it is confidential, it is non-binding till a settlement is arrived at. And this is an important part of the system because A, it reduces the load of cases that have to be heard. It enables a settlement in a great deal of cases. Look, many cases, motor vehicle compensation cases, uh, cases related to breach of contract, payment of money, check bounce cases, payment to banks. Look, the scope for dispute there is very limited. Those are not cases that necessarily require family cases, matrimonial cases. These are cases that require parties by and large to come together rather than just take a judgment and say, I won. So yes, mediation is being uh, very favorably used in, in the system. But I wouldn't say it's the order of the day because this, the, the fact is that a lot of cases can't be mediated. You can't mediate a criminal matter, for example. You may have a plea bargaining in certain cases. But a murder case can't be mediated, a rape case can't be mediated, a challenge, a challenge to the constitutional validity, let us say, of Aadhaar cannot be mediated. So a, a, a lot of public law, criminal law, etc. stays outside the scope of mediation. And those cases have to be decided by the courts and the courts alone. Okay. I have a question for you. I was watching a, a, one of your talks on YouTube last night. Um, sure. You spoke about uh, so I my my knowledge of the law is limited, but I found this concept interesting. You said um, we have a rights based constitution. Um, so as as lawyers, uh, the, the the 
the job is not just to enforce the law, but it's also to reimagine it um, and and to question the stat- status quo. So, could you talk a little bit about this and 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 what you mean here? Yeah, sure. I mean, this will need a longish answer, but let me say it in a nutshell. <clears throat> We're having this conversation a couple of days after Dr. Ambedkar's birth and <laughs> birth uh, birth date, and he was one of the key uh, draftsmen of the constitution and his idea was that it's not enough to simply get political freedom from the british and say that you know you have one vote and therefore you're politically equal that's only the starting point the aspiration is social equality right is to equalize those at the bottom of the ladder with those at the top that can be based on economics it can be based on caste it can be based on religion it can be based on region color ethnicity gender and so on and that's where i think the imagination of our constitution comes in because it hasn't necessarily thought of all aspects take for example gay rights right now the constitution by itself doesn't talk about gay rights but you had to reinterpret article 21 which is the right to life to mean that it includes the right of sexual choice <clears throat> and if that choice is being made privately uh, by the consent of two adults then that ought to be legitimate so that's the reimagination of the law and there are a million examples that i can give you where a simple uh, provision in the constitution can be expanded to include the right to an environment the right to the internet for example the right to clean water the right to sanitation online privacy absolutely so that's that's the process that i'm talking about that's super interesting um yeah okay so uh, another question we like to ask everyone who comes on um is so we are a commu- we're building a digital community for creative people uh we're doing sure. it on instagram and on other social channels what does the word community mean to you oh good question i mean it basically means uh um people who have the best interests of others at heart um to me that is community the moment you begin to think beyond yourself you're part of a community uh, that community can transcend two people in in an apartment to the to the nation and possibly the world at large but i think the test for a community is are you thinking beyond yourself mm. are you thinking at the interests of things and people around you uh, are you fair in your approach to those matters are you approaching them with genuine interest and not with ulterior motives i think if you if you answer those questions in the affirmative uh, the community follows um, for example you mentioned my my theater circle uh, that's a community it's yeah. a community because i'm not a, i'm not a theater person i'm a lawyer i'm just a a, a a theater buff but i find people who love theater as much as i do coming together and we have living room readings that's a community right nobody is there for personal gain or for publicity and that that theory or that principle can be extended to any community it could be extended to the very fine work that you do your your co-working spaces uh, your ideation that takes place it could be extended i think um, to the response that we have to covid as we speak there are people who need is a community forming just around as a response uh, to absolutely. that absolutely absolutely yeah. and that that's that's the answer yeah thank you so much that that's such a unique and uh, unique perspective um so so today's talk uh, we decided to call it the law the lockdown and a new world order um i i want you to spend i want to spend the last 5 minutes just talking about how you think we're going to get through this crisis as as humanity um, as in india and uh, globally and how do you th- how do you think we're going to come out of this both from a legal yeah. and and an economic perspective look it's it's a it's a problem at multiple levels so it's going to be hard for me to respond to each of these to begin with i have to say that i hope that the new world order that emerges is more humane and just um i hope people learn from this experience realize how well delicate our lives are right a lot of things we took for granted were all on the chopping block and that risk remains even today people are falling like flies so a i hope that people come away 
more humane and more just and justice is at the heart of the legal system as well i hope that people like me in the profession uh, lawyers uh, clients judges young lawyers can introspect a little bit and say it's not always about us it's not just about our ambitions our uh, income our reputation it's also about seeing the larger picture and being able to deliver in that sense of community that you mentioned so i have no doubt if we keep that spirit we'll come out of it and we'll come out of it the better beyond that there are going to be multiple paradigm issues we will have to deal with it's not just healthcare uh, and public health it's going to be the economy quite obviously it's going to be the the thrust of technology upon us the law is far behind it has to catch up you need new privacy legislation you need legislation that can deal with intellectual property in emerging times you need legislation that can better deal with the ecology right there are parallelly along with covid there are issues happening relating to wildlife poaching and so on where we are short today yeah. drones are being introduced to try and track poachers because nobody is going into the forests anymore so there yeah. are going to be a whole lot of lateral issues that come up and they're going to need the law to step up um, and look at them but at the end of the day i hope that that means a more just system it means a, a a regime that can look out for the underdog look honestly uh, i think a lot of people like us who are financially privileged if we're lucky and we're healthy we should come out of it there should be no issue of course there's the the annoyance of the lockdown but for a lot of people this is going to be life altering in a different way right if covid doesn't kill them poverty will malnutrition will other disease will uh not just them but their families and that's where i think a slightly more uh, equitable response i think is what i'm looking for um it may seem slightly lopsided it means somebody takes a hit it may sound socialist at one level but this is the time i think for us um um to look at those segments because if we don't then what have we learned from this uh the virus is going to be around it's not going anywhere and as i've been reading it's not just this virus there are sort of mutations of the strain which are already around so it's not that covid is going to be the first or the last yeah. virus we're going to see so mm. those issues are going to remain and probably this preparation will keep us better uh prepared in the future but i hope that the sort of the the human learning from it leads to a a, a better uh, tomorrow for all of us wow that was an uh, amazingly eloquent response i think i think to add to that uh, as a society as people uh, we're going to come out of this um not more we're going to come out of this stronger we're going to come out of this more human and better prepared to face uncertainty and i think long term that's going to help us um um to deal with anything that's thrown at us um so Absolutely. one last question um sure. what uh, i don't know i don't even know if you can call it a question but what's what's your message um to everyone that's watching uh with all this uncertainty uh being locked down being at home not knowing things are getting extended they're not this is allowed that's not allowed um what's your one message to everyone uh, on a final note what do you want to leave us with well i think it's the message that i give to myself on a daily basis because it's not easy coping but i think we've got to thank our stars uh, if we're healthy and if we're uh, reasonably well provided for in terms of you know food and entertainment and so on and that itself makes us better off than a lot of the others and remember i mean it's not just us everyone's in this i think this is the first time the entire globe has in a sense come together in such a in in such a unitary sense where everyone has the same problem all other problems are forgotten and covid is the one single thing that in a funny way has unified us so i think uh, stay cool about it uh, you don't have to come out of this being uh, completely life altered with new skills and so on if you do well and good but otherwise uh, staying generally constructive i think helps the only reason i got down to sort of writing uh, my my you know converting my thesis to the book was there's only that much sort of netflix and so on that you can do and you need a little bit of uh, fulfillment so try and find a little bit of fulfillment try and get a bit of exercise to stay healthy but over and above that i mean stay cool about it uh, take it one day at a time i've got my wall where i tick off every day uh, that goes by and um, i think sooner rather than later we should be out of it for the better
That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us your time. Uh, thank you for coming on live. I know this is the first time you've come on Instagram live. Uh, you were a real sport, and uh, I just from from our entire audience, thank you for taking all our questions so patiently. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Hasan. I really enjoyed this interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor.